Welcome to Vibrational Revelations. My name is Elena. My name is Alejandro. And today we have such a special guest, uh, Lars Mull. Lars is from Denmark. He's a mystic author, I believe now five or six books, and a musician. Mm. And I want to go back into, because I was reading some of your biography and you talk about it in your books as well, of how the entire awakening experience has happened for you as a child, mm. um, how one's personal tragedy and grief can open up incredible doorways for our own growth potential and how you've allowed for that process to unfold in such a beautiful way. I know for you, it was a loss of your sister when you were 10. Mm. And that, as you said, um, the veil was lifted and mm -hmm. you didn't perceive the difference between the physical reality and the unseen world. It all became one to you. So I'd love to go into, into that aspect and then of course, into your incredible body of work. Mm. Yeah, um, to try to cut it short, it it, <clears throat> it was really like, you know, when my sister came in, I was four years old. And at one point, you know, when you have suddenly this beautiful little angel comes in, you know, and she gets all the attention. And I guess in a, in a just a moment of jealousy or, you know, whatever child is, uh, I had that thought, oh, I wish she weren't here, you know. Mm -hmm. So when she suddenly became sick and died, you know, this was my first experience of you should be very careful for what, what you wish for. And it, it, it totally, you know, the rock was pulled away on them, beneath me, you know, and from that moment on, I could not go to school. I could not really participate in, in ordinary life. I was becoming more and more sensitive. And it was in a way that was very frightening because I had no, I did not have any, I, of course, as a 10 year old, you cannot reflect about these things. And I could not talk to any uh, of the grown ups, my parents. And so in a way, I thought that afterwards, Late, many years later, I understood that this was actually maybe a gift from my sister to me, mm. because it meant that I, I, I could per perceive my own business, so to speak, or my real path. And meaning that I, one day I was just cycling around town, because I had to pass time, you know, instead of going to school, I was just going to the woods or whatever. So it was cold that day and I went into the main church in Aarhus and uh, it happened that the organist was practicing playing. And when I, I stepped in there, I was, it was like oh, this organ music, you know, that filled the whole room. And somehow I was just drawn into it. And it, that was the healing when the healing started for me and also my musical um education you could say so from that day on i i sought out all the the churches in town um to find when find out when the organ player in that church was uh, rehearsing so i could go one day to that church the next day to that church. so my whole week was actually taken up by going from churches and um, having these experiences but it meant that i was really really fighting to to understand that what was real in in the physical world and or if it was of if the, the the unseen world or the etherical world was more real you know and i really really had a hard time uh, figuring that out and i was like you know thrown in between two worlds and it, it was really really disturbing because it frightened me and I also I could also suddenly start to to look through the grown-ups you know they I, I found out that they felt one thing said another and did a completely different third thing you know and that was really scary to me because it was not that my parents were in any way you know they were tremendous uh, parents they wanted the best for their child and, uh, so it, 
the problem is they did not know what to do, you know, with it. And in the school, I think they were just lucky that I did not come because they did not know what to, what they should do with a, a boy at that time. We should remember this is, is in in uh, in the late fifties and in the beginning of the sixties. It was just the beginning of the new psychology thing that you brought in uh, into the school. So at that time, when I went there, they did not know what. I got this little book uh, by Anonymous Post, and um, I found out. I, and and I never found out who sent it to me, but it was uh, a little book of aphorisms from Hasrat in Ayat Khan, a Sufi master. And of course, I did not know that at the time. I did I saw the name, but I did not know who he was. But that was actually the start of my my education, you could say. And I learned actually, I learned to speak English by that book. Amazing. Mm -hmm. You know what, what I find interesting too, because then later on you talk about your journey into when you went to Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you were in, were you in your 20s at that time or younger? I was 18. 18. Yeah. Uh, and that was a very profound uh, moment of realization that you were in this, you had this deep connection. And the question that I have for you, did you know that being there is going to lead you to this body of work that you applied many years later in your life you know at that time i was starting to to mm -hmm. i was very interested in in the yeshua and i knew that there was more to the story than that we were told and um so i remember i was 17 or something i got hold of one of edgar casey's books on yeshua where he also mentioned the scenes and the first time I, I, I read about these scenes there, I knew that this was something really, it hit me right home. So we were in a three month um, tour of Israel with my band. And on a, a day off, we were taken out to see different sites in Israel. And we went to Kuman at the Dead Sea. And when we came there, the guide was starting to tell us about this and that. And there was the uh, scrollery and there was this and there was that and suddenly I heard myself say no it was actually over there the scholarly was not there it was there and everything stopped you know and everybody looked all my bandmates they looked at me as I was crazy you know what is he talking about but lucky for me the in that little group that we were there was also a German scroll scholarly professor who were there because of the Dead Sea Scrolls and he said I think the young man is right. <laughs> and that was really relieving for me because I, I did not know why I said it. And, and, and at that time, I only felt really connected, you know. So from that moment on, I, it really, I, I, I knew that there was so much more and that I had to, to go down that path in order to find out what it was. Mm -hmm. Is that when you, did you actually study Hebrew and Aramaic or just Aramaic language? Aramaic, you know, the workings of Aramaic is the same as Hebrew and Arabic, but yeah. um, um, Aramaic is the mother of Hebrew and Arabic. And um, you can speak uh, those languages as any other language, but if you want to know the secret behind it, you go to the rabbis within Hebrew or you go to the Sufis in the Arabic world, you know. So there is so much more to, to uh, Aramaic and um, Hebrew that, that meets the eye. And if you don't know it, you have no chance of really reading the New Testament or parts of the Old Testament that was written in Aramaic. So um, I discovered that in the 80s by an American woman called um, Edith Stauffer. And I wrote with her, uh, I, write, I wrote to her and she sent me some stuff and I started to study from there. There weren't that much to, to read and study at the time, but she provided me with texts that I could start to write or read. 
So that was the beginning. And uh, funny enough, it was also the beginning at the same, around the same time uh, of my studying Mary Magdalene. Uh, when I, the first time I read the Gospel of Philip from the Nag Hammadi scriptures, who were found in 1945 in Egypt. And I read this first sentence where it is said that there was three Marys that always followed Yeshua, his mother, his sister, and his lover. And that lover being Mary the Magdalene, <laughs> and she was the disciple, you could read that in the Gospel that Yeshua loved the most and often kissed on the... And then there was a hole in the manuscript. So it did not tell what part of the body he was kissing her on. But to me, you know, it was, I would not say a shock that uh, Yeshua... It was just the surprise of hearing that for the first time, that Yeshua had kissed a woman. And a lot of times, you know, that was not what we have learned, you know. So I started to investigate and found out through some of the Jewish scriptures, Josephus, that was a historian from the time of Yeshua, that said that uh, married people would not kiss in public. So if Yeshua had kissed Mary the Magdalene in public, it must be for another reason. And he said that him being a former Essene himself, that that was the way the initiates initiated, recognized, and revered each other by kissing each one on the mouth. So now I had two informations. From the Gospel of Philip, it was told that he, it, Mary the Magdalene was Jesus' lover. And from Josephus, I heard that she was an initiated person, you know. So I thought about the kiss of Judas he must also have been an initiated because if he had wanted to point out Yeshua to the Roman soldiers, he could just have done it, you know, by standing in the bushes and say, it's him there. No, he had to go and kiss him because if he hadn't done that, everybody would have been suspicious in, in the party of Yeshua. So Jesus have also been an initiate. So that was my start, my really the beginning of my interest for Mary the Magdalene, because I, then I knew that there was so much more to the story than just what we have heard that she was a prostitute and all these things. And there's absolutely no, you cannot find any part of the New Testament that that somehow would uh, witness that she was a, pro uh, a prostitute. Absolutely not. Uh, yes. What is your, your uh, impression of what actually happened with Judas? Mm. What, 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 please? Uh, what, well, what, I... actually, what actually happened with Judas, you know? The... Yeah, it's, it, we can, of course, we cannot know for certain, but to me, there's no doubt that he was in part of the story that Yeshua had said to, in order to get this going. You know, he needed somebody to go and and do what Judas did to him. Problem for Judas being afterwards that he could not bear it to be the person who have done that when he saw the result of it, even if it was something Yeshua had asked him to do. So he went to and took his own life. That that is my belief. But of course, we cannot know for certain, you know. Right, and then somewhat uh, matches what we have revealed. You know, we we revealed uh, his frequencies during one of our episodes, and and uh, our conclusion was that exactly what you just said, very similar. Uh, All right. Yes, because his frequencies didn't show that he was um, one who will would betray uh, betray Jesus or Yeshua, uh, you know, consciously and purposely. And, and he was in the light. Actually, he was actually in the light. You know. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes. High frequency, high frequencies throughout his whole chart. Yeah, mm -hmm. I believe that's just so. Yeah. It's beautiful confirmation. We never actually discussed it with anyone. So this is yes. such a gift that you brought it up. I'm glad that you, yes, you thought of it. Thank you for it. sharing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. 
And I wanted to go back and talk a little bit about the, the scenes um, yeah. because it is such an important um, group, mysterious group. It's a group of mystics. And we've mm -hmm. seen mystics throughout so many cultures, right? And we know that scenes stem from, just like Yeshua, Mary Magdalene, they stem from Judaism. And the question, of course, comes up then, uh, you know, are they linked to the mystery schools and, and the Kabbalistic studies, which is all studies of your inner world, inner wisdoms, inner workings, because that will reflect the, 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 how the world uh, actually works in itself. So let's go touch a little bit upon the Essenes and mm -hmm. their connection. And perhaps where do you see how it's moved on to our modern day times. I'm sure there's those beings that are practicing it. So. I, to me, it, the mystic, um, the mystic um, tradition that goes way back to when man first came to earth. And I, I believe that the first who came here were not really manifested physically. They were still in the etherical realm. And because if you if you if you understand the the thing about, you know, about you know, if you read it, that is actually one of the very, very um, exciting things to start to do to write to read the Bible to the Aramaic. And of course, also to a lot of the the rabbis who knows about these things, that it is said, you know, before everything was created, God's spirit hovered over the waters, and that spirit is, spirit is the Shekinah, the Shekinah being the manifest in the feminine, fe, uh, the feminine uh, manifesting power. Of God. But just mind you, what water are they talking about? Because they say over the waters before anything was created. Mm -hmm. So it must be some metaphorical waters. And I think it's the water of a pregnant woman, you see, because nothing comes into this physical world but through a woman. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes in, are uh, manifested. It goes for animals, humans, all kinds of beings. You have to go through the feminine in order. So the Shekinah is actually that feminine. She's the one who manifests things, you know. So if you think that the masculine part of the creative force that we call God has the idea and has the seed, the idea of this life, so before it is actually manifested, it's already there in the etherical. And it, I think it's interesting because it goes for all of us. We have an idea of doing this program and before it's manifested, it's already sent out in the etherical. And just think about it. If we were aware of the possibility we would have, how we could strengthen things, uh, our ideas to become manifest to the knowledge of how to do it, you know. So that shekina, that feminine manifesting power is something that we are carrying within. You see, if, if we take this for granted that we were born in the image of God, that is what we are told. What is that image of God? Yeshua is pointing to it later on in the New Testament when he said, remember, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And uh, if you take the Aramaic for kingdom of heaven, Malkuta Deshem Aya, and you take out the root word for these Malkuta and Deshem Aya, for example, Deshem Aya, you go into the Shem. If you were just using the, the speaking uh, an ordinary word, it would say name, Shem is name, but it is, it is actually sound, light, light as consciousness, vibration, the seed of life, 
it is the very image of God that we carry within us. This Shem Aya, Aya means which is forever, meaning that this principle is something that can never perish. It's something that, and it is true that we, we too can start to, to create. In order to do it, we also know, have to know about the law of light, the unwritten law that is behind everything. And meaning that if we start to create without taking care of the law of light, we will become black magicians and it will come to nothing at the, in the end. We, we cannot create anything of value and that is what we are experiencing now in the world we are in now. We are, we are living in the world of questions and we are looking for answers in the world of questions. But when you start to do what you do, for example, by trying to penetrate things and go in to see the frequency of things, you are reaching out for the world of answers. And the world of answers stops where the intellect, the intellect cannot go there. And that's the problem in our world because most people that, that don't know that there is more than the intellect. They think that's the highest they can go. But that's actually where spiritual life begins. Mm -hmm. Of course, we need our in intellect in order to, to analyze and to, to communicate and stuff like that. But when we would experience things as mystics, that is what the mystic really is all about. He is his own uh, laboratory, you know, he's, he, he, he's his own uh, guinea pig, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So he, true prayer, true meditation, true clairvoyance, all kind of clear-sightedness and clarifying uh, issues, she and he will uh, reach out for the world of answers. And that's where <laughs> the book of life, you could say, where we can read the book of life and in order to do that we should know much more about the ethereal before the the physical manifestation and of course we should also know about the the manifestation of ideas if we want to to manifest them on this physical plane but it's not necessary always because a lot of things can be done in the ethereal it's, it's such a, a huge um, uh, thing to speak about because for many, many years I have really tried to find words for the, all these things in order to, to share it with people because I think it is so, it is so, um, it's so needed, you know, that we know what capacity we have and what powers we are connected to. And for too long, too many people have gone through life without knowing about it, you know, and when they, they are leaving this world, some of them are waking up and find out there's something missing. And then it, it's too late in this lifetime, anyhow. But why wait, you know? That's another thing. Uh, if not now, when? If not us, who? You know, we need to understand that there will be a certain limit maybe to the chances we are getting, you know? So we, I think it's, these, if, if we are talking about end times, which I don't like to talk about, because I think it's always end times, it has always been end times, because we are giving a chance now that it is so profound that we need to, to bow down and pick it up. Mm. Does it make any... Of yes, course. Yes, definitely. So... It resonates fully. Yes. But uh, so coming back to the to the to Shekinah and the, the feminine, that opens up to another thing that uh, I think one of the most important tasks when we are talking about Mary Magdalene, why have she come in and have a renaissance right now and have had for the past 25 years? It is because we need her now to, in order to have the whole understanding of the feminine principle. And that is all we need now. And when I'm talking about the feminine and the masculine, I'm not talking uh, specific about men and women, because the feminine has also to be 
be integrated within men as the masculine must be integrated in women. You know, every masculine man has a, a drop of femininity in him. And the same goes for the, for the females that they carry some part of the masculine within. So we need to discover that. And I think there is such a beautiful saying in a gospel of um, the gospel of the Nazarenes, where Jeshua is saying these words, I and my bride are one just mm -hmm. as Mary the Magdalene, whom I have chosen for myself as an example is one with me. I and my bride are one, exactly as Mary the Magdalene, whom I have chosen for myself as an example is one with me. He's talking about a bride on one side and Mary Magdalene on the other side. But mind you, Kalta, who is the Aramaic word for bride, can also point to an inner feminine principle. So what he is actually saying is, I have found my, I have connected to my inner feminine principle. And that principle I've seen mirrored in an earthly woman, Mary the Magdalene. Therefore, I have chosen her as my teacher, because she's one with me. And in the New Testament, one of the um, disgraceful changes that have been done there was when, for example, when it said that Yeshua was uh, taking out seven deadly sins of Mary the Magdalene. It's so obvious that this is something that was rewritten in the Middle Ages or something. What it actually says is that he opened the seven heavens in her, you know, and that was his gift to her. So they were each other's teachers and talking about chakras that was the what they called the seven chakras in this tradition the seven heavens you know base chakra root chakra being first heaven uh, sacral chakra seven a second heaven uh, solar plexus third heaven heart fourth heaven throat fifth heaven uh, row sixth heaven and i was in the seventh heaven you know, and they called the whole etherical body for the rope of glory. Mm, the rope beautiful. Of glory. So a, a person who were initiated and uh, was had come to full knowledge of who he or she was, would be revered as one who had uh, discovered his or her rope of glory. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like mm. somewhat a fully integrated being. Yes, exactly. Yes. exactly. And it shows up actually so beautifully because we did an episode on Mary Magdalene mm -hmm. and Yeshua, and they were identical in their frequencies. And mm -hmm. they, they're both what we would call the avatars. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, he had to choose somebody who was fully integrated, just like he was. And it's also important to keep in mind that masculine has been at the forefront for so long. And this is why you said this evolution uh, of Mary having to come in and over the last 25 years to recognize that the feminine can no longer be ignored. Mm. But this divine, pure divine, integrated feminine essence is equally important exactly. uh, to be recognized and integrated in okay. our own consciousness. Yeah. In the Gospel of Thomas, uh, Jeshua is saying that when the two become one, they will move mountains. You know, mm. the one without the other is just half the story. So every time I talk about Yeshua, I'm talking about her too, and vice versa, because I think that's very important to uh, remember that. Mm, mm -hmm. So beautiful. beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and now let's talk a little bit about, um, you had an experience, I believe in the 90s, and I don't know what happened to you physically, right? And that was also another part of your big awakening uh, when you were bedridden for a couple of years. And then mm. that's how the seer came into your life and yeah. brought you on to uh, aligning yourself with, with this bigger mission. Yeah. Yeah, I had been in the music business. Um, you know, I turned to, to music when I was young, not because I had any ambitions really there, but, you know, it was the 60s and I found a community of small, a, small, a group of, of, of young men as myself 
that were there for the same reason. We all thought we would. It was because of music, and of course it was also. But it was to find a place in the world for sensitive people. So that became my life, so to speak. But my secondary life, because my primary life was to study. So I studied and studied and studied, and I, 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 I had an income from the music and being a songwriter, writing songs for others and stuff like that. And I had had a, an identity. I could have a place in the world. But somehow I knew that this was over, you know, when I came to the nineties. But it was really, really, really difficult for me to 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 find out how to to take that step, you know, and stop it, you know. So I ended up in a bird bed for three years, and uh, uh, and eventually I got connected to the seer Kelly de Montségur, a true a good friend, who I learned later she had uh, um, cured her for cancer, healed her. So through the telephone, he got me out of bed within five minutes. Mm-hmm. And um, half a year later, I, I, <clears throat> yeah, a little more, I started to, I met him, I took down, I, I traveled down to to southern France, to the Pyrenees, and met him at the holy mountain, Mont Segur, and became his uh, apprentice, so to speak, and worked with him for nine years until his death. And that was, uh, you know, I came with all my knowledge. I thought I knew everything. I read all books that you can remember. They're studying and studying and studying. And now I meet a man that haven't read anything, but had practiced all his life. And very quickly I found out I knew nothing because mm. I, I needed to, you know, everything from my youth, I have tried to, to bury, so to speak, because I just wanted to, have a life, so to speak, you know. But um, starting working with him was, yeah, a huge thing for me. It, it turned everything upside down. And I, as I said, I understood that I absolutely did not know anything before I experienced it really. In when I was able also to reflect about things, you know. So he helped me to regain my my access to the etherical uh, that I had as a child, but now um, with the full apparatus of understanding what was going on and also understanding that my task was to try and find words for the experience, you know, that many people have tried to do and more or less uh, successful. So I knew it was it was not an easy task, but I, I knew it's my, my, he always called me the scribe and he also told me that I was a former scribe at uh, the Essene at Qumran. Uh, and I knew that was true. Also my experience from when I was there as an 18 year old, you know, and my, how I responded to it. So I knew that was true, but him telling me was uh, the final confirmation. And, and I knew, okay, this is my task in this life to to share with people my knowledge about the Aramaic and the, the real mystery of Yeshua and the Magdalene. Mm. So beautiful. Did you live in South of France at that time, or no? Was I lived in Denmark, but I I started to spend more and more time with him months at a time, you know. And then he lived in uh, Andalusia in southern Spain, mm. so I also spent a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. Uh, months at the time, sitting by his side when he was working, when people was phoning him from all over the world, <clears throat> and and really finding out also how, you know, he was a man of very few words, so I really just have to to be very present, you know, and and find out, in order to find out what was going on, what was he doing, you know. And of course, we were also working and training with a lot of stuff like um, communicating just through the ether with thoughts and and uh, remote viewing and all these things that was very mm-hmm. exciting. And, but that also that only happened after a year of purifying, where I went in in the in in the Pyrenees, where for months on length I was just walking 
carrying stones in my rucksack up to the mountain and throwing them out, going down, picking them up again, up to the mountain and throwing them up as a part of a purifying. Ah, interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what you also shared is such a great example of what you said earlier, that up until your 40s, you were very much connected to the intellect and the intellect yeah. was limited. And he opened up and reminded you of what is, which yeah. is way beyond the information field. That It is the intelligence, divine intelligence that flows through all of us. And it, yeah. it is not necessarily about finding the right words to describe it by allowing to be present in the moment to experience it, to really understand it. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. I, I think that you don't need words to, to, to describe anything. But I just found that this is my job, you know, so to try to do it anyhow. So <laughs> to, to the best way we describe it, the best way we can, because I think that once we come down to a, a specific uh, definition, then we have to start all over because that means that that's not <laughs> true, really what we are uh, uh, looking at or describing. Because once we define it, we're limiting it, and therefore mm. it cannot be it. Exactly. Right? But, but I think there is somehow you can be, be very lucky to find um, sentences and words that become openings, mm -hmm. or they really ignite something. The way that words are put together and sentences, you can take one sentence and you can take it out and you can, you can move it to another place in the whole thing. And suddenly it becomes, oh, that makes a huge difference. And um, this is the working, for example, of the Aramaic, that for example, Aramaic is built from root words. And people who speak Aramaic, they would reckon every human being as a root word. A root word is a quality that awaits its awakening to be ignited, awakened, and be manifest, you know? So a lot of root words, they go through life without being awakened, you know, become a word or a sentence or a poem, you know? And that's what I like, you know, that there is a poem within us, but somehow it just became this root that nothing absolutely happens there. It's just waiting and waiting and be it blindly doing whatever we are doing without knowing it. That is the, the shim, the seed that we are carrying. And suddenly when it opens up and we, we are aware of it and we start to nourish it, it becomes not just a word or a sentence. It becomes a whole poem. It comes a lot of poems. It becomes a whole story, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we start to communicate with each other, you know. That's a somewhat amazing, I think. That's so beautiful. Oh, yes, beautiful. So where do you, so as of today, where you are today, I know you're in Denmark, but overall in your experience and your mission in life, uh, where do you feel you are today? And the books, I know that you've published several more books since uh, the three books that I've read, uh, mm. but perhaps you can list some of the books that you've written so people also can find you uh, on your website. And somebody in our community said that you were also teaching. I'm not sure if you're still teaching. Are you teaching programs? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm uh, traveling around Europe and, uh, and I also have uh, some, some um, classes on uh, the internet. But um, yes, I, I, are you guys, you're, you are living in the States, yeah? Yes, in Florida. Yeah, uh, yeah. where are you in the States? Tampa, Tampa, Florida. Ah, yeah, we have been there, Kitsa, my wife and I, and we have actually been, oh, what's the name, we, where we did workshop. Uh, that's some um, five years ago or something. Oh, you, I didn't know you were here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we were invited by, his name was Jim, I did, the name of the, the city, it's on the east coast of, of Florida. Ah, what is the name? South of the... Oh. Palm Beach, Boca Raton. Uh, well, we are on the other coast and Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota. I don't know if you were. It's Sarasota. 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 Yeah, we were in Sarasota. 
Okay, that's an hour from us. Hopefully you'll be back. If not, we would love to. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, um, years ago, um, we were, I, was, I was invited to uh, Al Jatin from the Beach Boys because he had read the, the, the trilogy. And uh, that was my first time in Israel or in, uh, in America. So we went there and did uh, some work there also. But that was on the west coast of, um, you know, in California. Mm. Or else I we tra I travel in Europe, in England, in Israel, and, and mm. so forth. What do you teach uh, in All your the program? That we have been talking about here, for example, go, go into that and from my books, and that is, yeah, trying to. And we do a lot of uh, practices, of course, a lot of uh, singing. And, my latest book, uh, The Light Within a Human Heart, is actually about my visit to um, to Israel in 1916, being uh, part of a documentary on the Aramaic language, and what happened there when I visited the cave for at Qumran, where most of the, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. The, the very cave that uh, Helen Schuchman from the a course in miracles called uh, the holiest place on earth mm -hmm. and the place where actually Yeshua and Johanna and the Baptist was spending their 40 days in the desert. And I don't know if you've seen it, but the, the result of it was is on a video called the gate of light that is on YouTube, where I do this, uh, perf not performance, but this uh, practice. And you can see what comes of it, you know, because it's a very strong thing. It's a 2,500 year old Essene practice. And uh, this is something I, I travel around and work with people um, doing this thing. So one, one of the main things I'm doing. Mm. So it's, it's like yeah. chants, right? Chanting. Yeah, but because I think it's really, really important for, for people to have their own experience of things, you know. Mm -hmm. It, it's always insp inspiring to hear other people's experiences, but it's much better that you have an experience. So that's what I find in the West. A lot of people, they are, are working with things on an intellectual, intellectual plane, you know, thinking that it's very inspiring, but they are not really into it. They're not really doing it or practicing it. So, and I know that from my own, um, my own life, that is very important to, to not only to study but also to practice they must go hand in hand yes do you take people on tours to israel to, oh, to experience? I, a few i've done but mostly i've, I've done 55 tours to uh, the mont Segur, uh, the mountain in in the pyrenees but it's it's much more difficult to go to israel and arrange tours because and especially after the corona and all this the covid it's really, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Also with, with a lot of things going on there. But uh, I have lots of friends and I've been there many, many, many times. So. Mm. I love to come there. <laughs> this is one place we haven't been and I've been saying, I really want to go. <laughs> you must go. You must go. Mm -hmm. Promise me you go there. Yes. yes. You find it. Yeah. If you were able to make it to cave, Cave four, I think it is, right? The place yes, you were definitely. About. Because for us, it's also about experiencing the energy and connecting and seeing what comes through. You promise me if you go uh, just to connect to me and I will give you a few uh, good ideas to go where you should go, definitely. Yes. But there are places outside of, of the normal uh, thing, places where all tourists go. But actually, some very, very profound places you should, mm -hmm. you should visit. Definitely. Thank you so Looking much. For sure. Yes. Be sure to do that. Thank <laughs> you so much, Lars, for today. I guess yeah, the last thanks. thing I wanted to see uh, your, your message to the world. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to say something at the moment, what would be your message to, to humanity at this moment? The most important thing is everything that you're looking for here there or everywhere you already carry you are already enlightened now we must wake up and take responsibility for it and act accordingly i think that's the message 
And of yeah. course, uh, light is consciousness, and we are carrying that God consciousness within us. Mm-hmm. So now it just awaits our arrival. Mm-hmm. How beautiful. I think I heard beautiful. you say somewhere, um, referencing illness, that uh, pain is the messenger and the message is to wake up. Exactly. So, so many people are going through painful experiences over the last couple of years and it's yeah. really shifting on how we view that pain in our life and recognize it, that it's an invitation there's it there is a question there's four questions we need to answer who are we where mm. do we come from what are we doing here and where are we going and i think if we start going into these and f- try to find the real answers in the world of answers, we would know everything that we have been doing up, up to now would t- totally lose it, all our interest. We would not be interested anymore. We would know what to do. Mm. It's all right here, you know, it's here. So, mm-hmm. yes, I love that. who, if not now, when? <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> I love that. Look for the answers in the, in the field of answers than the field of questions, no? Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Very, very good. Thank you so Thank much, you so much. Lars. Take, take care, both of you. Thank you, you too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Bye-bye. You.